I want to, first of all, welcome you to Atlanta, and thank you for taking this time out. Jim, that's what I'm here for. And first of all, I want to say, without any conscious desire to flatter you, because I think I know you'd, you'd see through that, but as I said before we started, if you're not nominated for an Oscar for your performance in The Shootist, I think something's wrong with the, the Motion Picture Academy, because it's, I think, the most, one of the most understated performances you've ever given. Well, I thank you for that. Actually, uh, as a rule, the, you know, it was a wonderful part and uh, wonderful support given by other actors. And when you get that, uh, you know, that more or less ensures a nomination because uh, there are probably only ten parts of any size uh, during the year. and. Mm. Uh, if you reach in that hat and get one of those, you get nominated. <laughs> and I do appreciate the compliment very much, Jim, and uh, I shall cherish it. But uh, actually, you know, it's uh, who's had the best part usually mm -hmm. gets the yeah. the nomination, and one of them get the award. I think few people would be as qualified as you to talk about directors in the business because you have worked with the best, starting with one. Um, who I think ranks above all the others, and that's John Ford. What was it? I didn't start with him. I started with Raoul Walsh. Raoul Walsh, yeah. yeah. But it was Ford, I guess, who gave who you the started, big push. Who gave my career a boost. Yeah. What set Ford apart to you? Well, I know he I'm asking a, a question. No, that well, it takes I, books I, wanted, to I want to be very. I, I'm sorry to slow down the interview, but I think that the two things. One, that I think he would have been the finest painter in the country because uh, he knew how to use uh, his paints, his people, his uh, compositions were all magnificent. And I think he would have been and is probably as great a director as I know. He can take a long scene. Uh, in his early days, he had great patience with writers, and uh, he would make them write a scene one way, and they'd say, no, I'd like to get this, and make them write it another way, until he wore them out, and then he'd reach down in and out of a paragraph, take three lines here, two lines here, and uh, cut through all the hypocrisy, the phoniness, and, and get right to the, to the uh, most important uh, critical part of the speech. In later life, he, he, he didn't, uh, you know, he lost his uh, patience with that, but that didn't stop him making great pictures. Mm -hmm. Did he change at all then stylistically over the years? No, I don't think so. And he was uh, a man who uh, he took whatever assignment, you know, if you happened to catch him at the right time, he'd take an assignment that was a bigger challenge maybe than it's possible to make a top picture out of. Yeah. But something, regardless of whether it was a top picture or not, there would be something in it worthwhile going to see if Jack Ford directed mm -hmm. it. Because uh, he had that particular talent. Mm -hmm. All right, let me ask you a question that yes. film buffs are still arguing over, the main differences between Ford and Howard Hawks. Well, Howard Hawks, um, I mean, when you talk about Westerns, Pappy Ford's, uh, uh, his uh, editorial attitude, he grabs the best stories. Pictures are about people, or they're not very good. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, how to build a um, pyramid. Hawks found out was not uh, very important. You have to have interesting people. Jack Ford, like in in uh, um, Stagecoach, used all the Bret Hart characters, and he put them on in a delightful and and a bright and dramatic uh, manner. Uh, Howard Hawks will take a, a simpler story 
try and get a, a deeper uh, human humor mm -hmm. in his picture than, than Pappy. All of, you know, Jack uh, wouldn't think of making a picture without some humor, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it's, it's uh, and it's a different style. Jack comes, you know, they say that Jack Ford uh, comes on a set already and everything's set up. It, it, he comes on a set and he says, well, Duke, you come in that door, and uh, Jim, you come on. He says, now let's hear the line. Now, he's already established a feeling for this scene, but before he says to you, now you come in and sit down here and say, he get, lets the actor become free in the line. Mm -hmm. you know? It's the first time the actor has known where the table was going to be, where the chair was going to be, what's going on. So. He lets them rehearse like that while everybody else is off having coffee. Then he calls the cameraman over and says, well, what do you think? So they talk. And they're going to say, well, Jim, could you, uh, instead of stopping over there, could you stop here with the chair? And you say, oh, yeah. If they said to you, you come in and stop at that chair, you know, it, it uh, I don't know, it becomes by rote something. Yeah, yeah. The, Mechanical. He lets everybody have their own Whatever they have to give to the scene, he lets them give to the scene. Yeah. And then he melds all that. And he may find that, that two or three of the lines are wrong. So being a good editor, he'll pull this out and pull that out. Remember something from here and put that in to, to uh, correct it. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawks generally sets everybody down and says, now what if we did just the opposite? Duke, you know, what if you were playing so-and-so's part, and what if he was playing yours? And, you know, and, and he excites people into getting interested in the scene. Mm -hmm. okay. And if the scene isn't any good, he just won't uh, shoot it. But he never, I mean, today they go over millions and millions of dollars on the pictures that were supposed to cost three or four million, go to 10 or 12. Howard Hawks, you could probably figure, would spend... Uh, Say 10 to 15 percent more than perhaps Ford, who I think was this analytical and was quick to mm -hmm. get the best on the screen for the least amount of money. Yeah. But uh, naturally, for some reason, Walsh had a uh, reputation for for overspending. We mm -hmm. did a picture when we did Red River. He had never been a, in production. And they told him he could do the picture for a million six. Well, I had just made a, a little western for Republican, which I had produced, and we'd spent a million four, and, and we didn't have near the uh, problems or the locations or the number of people. So I tried to plead with him and my agent, who was the producer as well, that they were being taken by a production department. They wouldn't believe me. So it ran to, uh, I said, it's going to cost you somewhere around $3 million. It cost two eight. I said, if Ford was doing it, it cost two six. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple that at the beginning, they should have known that this man, that it was going to take that much for this man to make the type of picture that he was capable of making. Yeah. What do you see as the future of the traditional Western film? Well... Do you know of any country whose uh, uh, folklore has been destroyed? I don't, and it's, it's uh, our folklore. More has been written about it in prose and poetry than, than anybody else's folklore, and it's more loved around the world. Mm -hmm. And in our medium, I mean, the horse is the greatest vehicle for action that there is, so how... Uh, that's the only answer I can give you. I'm, I assure you, I've seen these pictures where they're trying to put the cowboys on the couch, but, <laughs> but once you make a, a picture, uh, you know, of uh, our legendary cowboy, uh, the American public and the world public want to see it. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you make another 25 or 30 of them because you're the best we have. I want to tell you something. I want to, too. 
and I want to bury everybody in this room, too. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That get her done? Yes, sir. Let me get this started. Sorry? Start audio tape. Yeah, sure. Will you close that door for just a moment, please?